It was hot in the tropics, a type of heat unknown to the men aboard the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria ships, led by Italian explorer Christopher Columbus. It had been months since these men left their home cities in Europe, and until then, Europe was all they knew. They were given a difficult and even dangerous task. Spain hired Columbus to find a new western route to Asia. They needed new routes for trading and buying spices, but it was far from a simple job. I mean, crossing the ocean never is. Little did those sailors know that their lives were about to change forever. Land in sight! Someone must have shouted on board. But when they finally stepped on that new foreign land, they discovered they were not in Asia. They had landed in the Americas. You've probably heard this tale before. Historically speaking, Columbus arrived in the Americas in 1492. But what would have happened if Columbus's ship had faced a lethal storm in the Atlantic Ocean and had never made it to the new land? What would today's history look like? First things first, nobody discovered anything. When we say that the Americas were discovered, we're kind of ignoring the millions of people who already lived there. You see, the Americas were only discovered from Europe's point of view. Columbus would only have discovered something if when he got there, he was faced with acres and acres of empty land. But that was not the case at all. Second, Columbus was not the first explorer to land in the Americas. Believe it or not, the Vikings approached American shores in the 10th century. Their expeditions have been well documented and accepted by scholars. Here's what might have happened. Around the year 1000 CE, Viking explorer Leif Erikson sailed to a place called Vinland. Cute name, huh? It's now a region in Canada called Newfoundland. But his crew didn't stay too long. They arrived to find 10 Native Americans napping under their overturned canoes. They attempted some trade, but I'm guessing the Vikings weren't too friendly and the Americans didn't really like them. The Vikings' account of the encounter shows they felt outnumbered and menaced, so they sailed away back to their land. That makes sense, right? As I said earlier, there were millions of people living in the ginormous continent of the Americas. Any foreigner would be outnumbered there. Now take a look at what North America looked like before our buddy Chris got there. It was not divided into the normal states we're used to. And if Columbus had never arrived, the United States would probably never have been united to begin with. After all, there were hundreds of first Americans living in these lands, and they lived amongst their own tribes, quite different from the Europeans. It's not accurate to think that there were no political systems going on in the Americas before Europeans arrived. We just need to understand that they were different from what we're used to today. When Europeans arrived, they imported their belief systems with them, from religious beliefs and language systems to things as simple as clothing habits. If the Americas had developed on their own, maybe their sense of fashion would be completely different today. You see, Europeans had a developed sense of fashion by the time they arrived in the West. They wore things such as this and this. But those don't really work in the tropics, do they? For them, fashion had to do with showing a certain economic status. While in the Americas, that didn't exist. For Native Americans, clothing was mainly functional and related to the weather. In warmer climates, native people would wear short-like cloths to cover their intimate parts. They would walk bare-chested and use shoes known as moccasins. Yes, similar to the moccasins you probably own. In colder climates, they would resort to using leather and fur parkas. Of course, there was always the special clothing used for ceremonial purposes. So I'm guessing that if Columbus never reached the Americas, Brands such as the Gap, Hollister, and Forever 21 would have never existed. But we could live with that, couldn't we? Here's a wild thought. Let's say that by the 1700s, Native Americans had developed complex engineering skills. They built big boats, maybe a bit smaller in size than the traditional European ships, and decided to venture across the ocean. Let's say they were the ones who arrived on European shores, in places such as Spain and Portugal. They carried gifts and goods with them for trading, of course. This was also a common practice amongst them back home, known as potlatch. 
Sure, they were received with suspicion by the Europeans, who had only ever traded with Asia. But with this inverted encounter, a different type of relationship began between Native Americans and Europeans. Since Europeans didn't claim ownership of the Americas, the people from the so-called New Land weren't considered inferior to them. Actually, they stood side by side as equals, each one with their own power and set of knowledge. Native Americans taught Europeans a new type of ruling system, a more decentralized one. So modern-day structures of government would look really different. Maybe Europeans decided that four years was a long time for someone to hold decision power, so they implemented smaller and more frequent elections. Oh, and the landscape of European cities also changed a lot. Instead of huge statues made of copper and bronze showing men and ships on their way to the Americas, the Europeans built totem poles in honor of their alliances with first Americans. In terms of medical and medicinal knowledge, they had a lot to exchange about. While Europeans were making advances in traditional medicine, Americans had developed an impressive knowledge of herbs that could heal a series of things. Before they knew it, Europeans were selling different varieties of plants in their pharmaceutical establishments. They had one big barrier though, language. Since Europeans never arrived on American shores, they also never taught their language to Americans. So maybe in this scenario, both cultures brought in their best linguists and tried creating a new language from scratch. Something that could be comprehensible from both perspectives and that could encompass both of their worldviews. The implications of this on modern day life would be really profound if you stop to think about it. Let's say that this newly created language involved some symbols and drawings in it. You see, Native Americans often told stories using symbols known as pictograms. They were quite literal sometimes. As you can see, a mountain was represented by, well, a mountain. It's crazy to think that this system of communication has been around for 5,000 years since it was actually invented by the Sumerians. And hey, maybe even our laptop keyboards would come equipped with these symbols, and you could write more visually hybrid and fun emails than the ones you write today. The American landscape would have also changed. You see, if neither Columbus nor any of the other European dudes that went after him reached the so-called new land, Central and Latin American cities would look completely different than they do today. Maybe the bustling empires of the time, such as the Inca, the Maya, and the Aztec, would have grown immensely. To be fair, they were already pretty big by the time Europeans got there. Some pre-Columbian Maya cities were as big as medieval London and Paris in terms of population. But oh my, the Mayan Empire would have grown so much that it could have spread out all over of Central America. They could have developed their pyramid building craft up to the point that they managed to build an even larger pyramid than the Giza Pyramid in Egypt. So tourists would come from all over the world to visit. Ah, and in South America? Let's just say the region could have turned into a huge forest, bigger than the Amazon. The Inca could have spread through the Andes and then into the mainland. Places such as Brazil and Argentina never existed. But in their place, there would have been dreamy tropical settlements, which would have become a worldwide reference in sustainable living. What makes a giant, well, a giant? You know, big, enormous, you get it. Tough questions. It depends on who you ask. The ancient Greeks had cyclops, while ogres were spread out through all sorts of European folklore tales. The tallest person ever recorded was named Robert Pershing Wadlow, and he lived in the first half of the 20th century. He stood at an incredible 8 feet 11 inches tall, but had many medical issues throughout his life. Sadly, he only lived to celebrate his 22nd birthday. That's because Robert wasn't just tall. He had a condition affecting his human growth hormone, which didn't particularly make his life comfortable. Robert even had to wear leg braces in his adult years. During that same time, incredible discoveries were reported in North America. Some people claim to have uncovered weird-looking skeletons, much larger than previously associated with human beings. It immediately raised the question, did giants really used to roam our planet? Our story begins with the idea of a mound-builder race. 
Some scientists back in the day claimed that these massive earthworks in places like the Mississippi Valley, called the Grave Creek Mound or the Great Serpent Mound, were built by some sort of prehistoric type of human, much larger and stronger than us Homo sapiens are today. From around 1812 to the 1860s, almost everyone in America writing about history was covering this mound-building race. However, not everyone agreed with the theory. There was this naturalist named Benjamin Smith Barton, for example, who warned about jumping to conclusions about giants. He believed that just because people discovered some big bones, they shouldn't immediately think of giants. But people didn't listen. Really? They simply wanted to believe about huge human-like creatures, despite not having any real scientific evidence. Newspapers were filled with these giant stories. They described finding giant skeletons, even featuring weird body parts. Con artists took advantage of the whole frenzy, with some putting together skeletons out of wood and rawhide and touring them as proof of the long-lost race of giants. Eventually, in the 1930s, an anthropologist from the Smithsonian took it upon himself to debunk the whole mystery. And his conclusions were straightforward. All those giant skeletons that were supposedly uncovered were either hoaxes or simply animal bones that were wrongly identified as belonging to humans. He also said that those who claimed to have discovered ancient giant remains were just not that good with human anatomy. You would think that's how the story ended. Well, it didn't. You see, people became so convinced that giants existed that they simply could not let go. Sound familiar? Because the Smithsonian was investigating these claims, some people started thinking they were up to something shady. They cooked up this theory that the Smithsonian scientists were secretly getting rid of giant bones to hide the truth about giants. This whole story survived through the years and made it all the way to 2014 is when this internet article said that the Smithsonian used to have tons of giant skeletons but destroyed them back in the early 1900s. And the drama continued. A famed publication even looked into the past of some of those Smithsonian scholars to try and pick apart their credibility. So the Institute had to do some damage control. They've since added new people on the team whose job is to figure out if those bones were correctly collected and studied. Now, it wasn't just North Americans that claimed to have stumbled upon giants. The French had their own discoveries, too. Their story takes us back to 1890, when an anthropologist was digging around a Bronze Age site in Castineau, France. What he found were three bone pieces that looked like they came from a giant human. The findings included a massive thigh bone, a shin bone, and a regular upper arm bone known as a humerus. Now, if we put all these bones together and calculate the proportions, they lead us to this towering figure, somewhere between 10 and 11 feet tall. However, in 2022, contemporary scientists took another look at those bones. They concluded they most likely belonged to a cave bear, not a human. It wasn't that unusual for people back in the day to confuse giant animal bones with those of humans. Now, the truth is, our ancestors were in fact taller than we are today, despite them not being technically giants. The average human body has changed a lot over thousands of years. We're not as big and strong as our ancestors were. In fact, we've been on a bit of a downsizing trend, especially in the last 10,000 years. And it's because of a mix of factors. Our genes, the world around us, and how we live our lives all play a role. Way back around 40,000 years ago, European men were towering at around 6 feet. They had a seriously tough life, though, hunting and gathering all day. That lifestyle required a good muscle structure, and their African roots might have given them that extra height, which came in handy in warm climates. Moving on to 10,000 years ago, we can already see a big change in European males. They went down to 5 feet 4 inches on average. What happened was the climate was shifting, and people were increasingly relying on agriculture to provide for their families. It wasn't all sunshine and comfort, though. Sometimes, failed crops and a not-so-diverse food meant a pretty unhealthy diet. Plus, being around farm animals more and more introduced some new medical issues to the mix. 
We're now around 600 years ago when the shortness continued. And yes, we can still blame it on poor diet and health. However, there seems to be a change in recent years. Today, European males are reaching an average of 5 feet 9 inches. And sure, the fact that we're eating more veggies and getting regular checkups at the doctor did help a lot. But it's also because of industrialization and living in cities. This has brought people from different backgrounds together, which is a good thing. It decreases the chances of human passing on genes that could cause problems. So it's a combination of better living and genetics that's making us taller. We shouldn't give up on ancient giants quite yet, though. You see, experts believe they recently discovered the remains of such a person who supposedly lived in ancient Egypt. Sometimes people can actually grow to large sizes due to a condition called gigantism, the same that made Robert Pershing Wadlow grow to such an impressive height. When some archaeologists were studying ancient Egyptian mummies, they came upon an interesting skeleton. What made it special was that they believed it might have belonged to a pharaoh who would have been really tall, like 6 feet 6 inches tall. To put that in perspective, that's way taller than Ramses II, who was the tallest recorded Egyptian pharaoh and stood at about 5 feet 9 inches. These experts took a closer look at the newly found bones, especially the long ones, and found evidence of something called exuberant growth which basically means this person's growth was off the charts. It's a clear sign of gigantism, they say. Now, this discovery is important because it makes this mummy the oldest case of gigantism in the world. No other Egyptian pharaohs were known to be giants. It's also fascinating because it tells us something about the health and nutrition of ancient Egyptian rulers. See, those pharaohs were probably better fed and healthier than regular people which might explain why they could grow taller than the average person. Now, you might be wondering if being a giant had any drawbacks back then. Well, it's hard to say. I wasn't around then. Still, during those early dynasties in Egypt, they seemed to prefer shorter people, especially in royal service. There are a lot of ancient Egyptian stories featuring short-statured leaders and even higher spirits that locals looked up to. The reason why is still a mystery that we might never fully solve. But since this mummy was found in an elite tomb, it's possible that being a giant didn't have a social stigma attached to it at the time. Maybe he was, in fact, seen as special. In 1928, Gloria Farley was a young girl with a big passion for exploration. She grew up in the town of Heavener, Oklahoma, and loved to visit local parks. One day, she found a weird-looking stone that had some bizarre symbols on it. Her fascination with the mysterious writings continued to grow. So, two decades later, she returned to study them and made a whole career out of it. See these weird drawings that Gloria stumbled upon back then? They're officially called runes and they were a system of writing used by Vikings, an ancient Scandinavian people. The word rune itself translates to secret word or secret letter. Runes were made up of different symbols, each representing a different sound or concept. These symbols were carved into stone or wood and were often used for inscriptions and messages. As an important part of Viking culture, they were used everywhere. From spiritual texts, to everyday communication. Why are these writings so interesting in the first place? Firstly, because there is no official text that explains the history or creation of the Viking runes. Some Vikings engraved runes onto the trunk of a tree named Yggdrasil. It was a mythical tree in Norse mythology. It was believed to connect the nine realms of the universe. It's described as a huge ash tree with branches that reach out to all corners of the world. The tree is often depicted with three main roots, one on Earth, one more extending into the underworld, and the last one reaching the realm of spirits. It's a symbol of the connection between things and the cyclical nature of life. But this is just folklore. In reality, the origin of runes has not been officially determined yet. Many people even question whether Vikings originally used runes. 
mostly because they think Vikings acquired their knowledge of runes during their travels. We know that Vikings traveled to many different places throughout their history. They started in Scandinavia, then went on to visit the rest of Europe, including the British Isles, France, Germany, and Italy. Some even reached the northern parts of Africa and certain regions of Central Asia, going as far as the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea. But there's another theory about Vikings and their travels that continues to baffle historians. Did Vikings actually discover America? Well, for starters, America was not discovered by anyone. The landmass of North and South America had been inhabited by indigenous peoples for thousands of years before the arrival of European explorers. But the first known European to reach the Americas was Christopher Columbus, who arrived at the Bahamas in 1492. So why do some people believe Vikings might have gotten there first? We have to travel back to the 19th century, when the idea that the Norse were the first Europeans to discover America took off. This belief was based on runes and Norse artifacts found in different areas in the U.S. That cobblestone path, first discovered by Gloria Farley, located in Heavener Runestone Park in Oklahoma, seems to tell the same story. To this day, this slab is one of the biggest historical mysteries in the U.S. Some believe that the runes on the stone were carved by Norse explorers in 1000 CE. At one point in her career, Gloria even reached out to the Smithsonian Institution and found out that they had already concluded in 1923 that the symbols had indeed been from a Scandinavian language. They translated to Nomedal, or Nome and Dal, which in turn translated to Sundial Valley, or Monument Valley. This information answered the question of what language the symbols belonged to, but left two other questions unanswered. Who carved the symbols, and when were they carved? During her professional life, Gloria collaborated with specialists in Norse history, geology, and epigraphy. She collected evidence that backed up her theory that Vikings had explored North America and could have easily navigated shallow rivers and creeks in their longboats. Though it may seem unlikely, it's not impossible that Vikings once sailed down the Mississippi River. In fact, Viking runestones have been found in various places all over North America, including Minnesota and Maine. In Oklahoma, researchers have discovered six of these runestones in total, though their validity is still uncertain. One Norse settlement, Lancey au Meadows in Canada, has been confirmed to date back to 1021 CE. This supports the idea of the Viking activity in North America during the estimated period of time of the Hevener runestone. The Hevener runestone's age cannot be determined through traditional scientific methods like carbon dating or organic material decay rate analysis. Therefore, researchers started to look for other evidence like Viking artifacts, or any other signs of their activity in the area. But none has been found to this day. That's why Vikings really visiting Oklahoma is a subject still up for debate. We can't finish our story about the Viking runes without mentioning the Futhark, which is a 16-letter alphabet. It was the basis for the earliest runic inscriptions that date back to around 200 BCE. At that time, the alphabet consisted of 24 letters. By 800 BCE, the number of letters was reduced to 16. The use of runes continued until the Middle Ages. Inscriptions on stone and wood were made with regular runes, while a different version of the alphabet was used for everyday messages on wood or bone. Runes were also commonly used on objects like combs to identify the owner. In the Viking culture, runes were used to honor brave fighters and heroes on memorial stones, such as the famous Gelling Stone in Jutland, Denmark. These stones were placed in public areas for all to see and had a big impact on the local culture. 
runes weren't the only interesting part of the Viking heritage. Contrary to popular belief, Vikings were actually known for their cleanliness. Excavations of Viking sites have revealed that they had access to grooming tools such as tweezers, razors, combs, and ear cleaners. Additionally, they were known to bathe regularly, often taking advantage of natural hot springs for their hygiene routine. This was in stark contrast to the hygiene habits of other Europeans at the time. They also had a knack for winter sports, which is not surprising given the Scandinavian weather. At least 6,000 years ago, Scandinavians created primitive skis, though it's believed that Asians may have invented them earlier. During the Viking Age, Norse people used skis for transportation and also for fun. They even had a spirit protector of skiing named Ullr, who was revered by Vikings. Vikings even had their own beauty standards, which were very important to them. Viking men who were not naturally blonde would use a strong soap with a high lye content to lighten their hair and conform to their culture's beauty standards. In some cases, beards were also lightened. These treatments may have also helped with another delicate issue of the time, that of head lice. Vikings were also known for their powerful ships, which were crucial to their expansion strategy. Their most commonly used boats were longboats, which could carry up to 60 people and were designed for easy docking and departure. Viking ships were typically made of wood, with the hull constructed using overlapping planks held together by iron rivets. The ships were powered by both sails and oars, and were often decorated with intricate carvings and animal figureheads. The reasons behind Vikings traveling almost everywhere in the world are not well understood. One theory suggests that their raiding trips were a result of limited opportunities in Scandinavia, including a lack of farmland and the practice of fathers leaving all their property to their oldest son. This left younger sons with no inheritance and no chance of finding land on their own, making them go on Viking explorations. Another theory is that there was an imbalance in the population of Scandinavia, with too many men and not enough women. This may have led Vikings to not only go searching for foreign treasures, but also to attract women as wives during their travels. Imagine sitting at home, drinking coffee, and watching a new episode of your favorite series, and suddenly, boom, crash, what's happened? Nothing terrible. Just a meteorite that has just crashed into your kitchen after breaking the roof. You might think this story is entirely made up. But that's what actually happened in New Jersey during the Ida Aquarid meteor shower, which is active from April 19th to May 28th and peaking on May 5th through 6th. The space rock itself was the size of a pork roll sandwich. It was also pitch black and weighed almost 4 pounds. It slammed through the roof and hit the wooden floor, ruining it. When the inhabitants of the house found the rock and touched it, it was still warm. Luckily, the thing wasn't radioactive and there was no one at home at the time this intruder arrived. But the most shocking thing about this meteorite? Astronomers believe it might have come from a cosmic snowball traveling far, far away from Earth. To explain this, I'll have to tell you a bit more about the Eta Aquarid. This meteor shower is famous for its fast meteors, leaving long, glowing trails. It's produced by Comet Halley, completing its orbit around the Sun every 76 years. The comet hasn't visited Earth since 1986 and won't come back until 2061. Right now, it's somewhere near the constellation of Hydra, which is more than 100 light years away from our planet. Every year, Earth has to pass through trails of debris left by the comet. They collide with our atmosphere, disintegrate, and create beautiful, colorful streaks in the night sky. And it happens every time Halley returns to the inner solar system. Its nucleus sheds a layer of ice and rock into space, and some of it reaches our planet. The central New Jersey authorities believe the meteorite that sneaked into the house originated from that meteor shower. But I feel that you might be pondering another question that confuses many people. What's the difference between all those space bodies? I mean, there are so many of them flying out there. Meteors, meteorites, asteroids, comets, ugh. Okay, let's figure it out together. 
An asteroid is a rocky body orbiting the sun. It's usually not very big and quite inactive. Comets are different. They're covered with ice that normally evaporates in sunlight, forming a coma, which is what a comet's atmosphere is called. This coma consists of dust and gas. A comet also has a tail that is made of dust and or gas too. A meteoroid is a small part of a comet or asteroid that orbits the sun. If this meteoroid manages to sneak into Earth's atmosphere and vaporize there, it's a meteor. It's often called a shooting star. And finally, if a meteoroid manages to survive the passage through our planet's atmosphere and lands on Earth's surface, it becomes a meteorite. If you think such space guests are a rare occurrence, that's not exactly true. Every day our planet is hit with more than 100 tons of sand-sized particles. About once a year, a large, car-sized asteroid enters Earth's atmosphere, turns into an impressive fireball and burns, luckily, before reaching the surface of the planet. And every 2,000 years or so, a meteoroid the size of a soccer field hits Earth, causing a lot of damage. And now, imagine this. A huge, really ginormous asteroid is approaching our planet. There's no one on Earth to predict its appearance. Neither is there anyone to stop it. That's why soon, the asteroid crashes into the surface of Earth. The force of the collision is so powerful that the space visitor doesn't stop until it gets through the crust to a depth of several miles. The impact leaves a crater of more than 100 miles across. Thousands of cubic miles of solid rock instantly turn into vapor. The crash sets off a series of natural disasters that erase 75% of life on Earth. The creatures that were close enough to see the crash don't survive for longer than a few seconds. Even closer to the impact crater, the ground is covered with thousands of feet of hot ash, grit, and rubble. Several seconds later, everything for many miles around bursts into flames but doesn't burn down within the next several minutes after the collision faces a different, even more terrifying fate. The asteroid causes a monstrous, largest ever tsunami. A recent study claims that it was thousands of times more powerful than any wave people have ever seen. The tsunami was so devastating, it eroded seafloor sediments half a world away. The team of scientists even remodeled the events of the first 10 minutes after the impact, and the model showed that the asteroid had produced waves up to 30,000 times greater than one of the largest tsunamis people have ever recorded, the one in the Indian Ocean in 2004. You've probably already guessed that I'm talking about a real-life event, namely the asteroid collision that wiped dinosaurs off the face of the Earth. The Chicxulub asteroid, as we now know it, is believed to come from the outer reaches of the solar system. This space body was at least six miles across. It crashed into the shallow seawaters near the Yucatan Peninsula. The impact was so powerful that it left its signature on the face of the planet. In 2021, researchers found out that the collision had carved mega ripples into Earth's crust in the region of modern-day central Louisiana. But such devastating events, when an object that large threatens Earth's inhabitants, happen very rarely once every few million years. Space rocks smaller than 80 feet usually burn up in the atmosphere of our planet, causing little to no damage. If a rocky meteoroid larger than 80 feet but smaller than half a mile across was to hit Earth, it would cause local damage to the impact area. As for a space rock with a diameter larger than half a mile, it'd likely have worldwide effects. And these space bodies aren't even the largest. For comparison, Asteroids populating the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter can be as huge as 580 miles across. But you can breathe out. They're too far away and don't pose any threat to our planet. All the time, our scientists keep learning more and more about hazardous asteroids and comets. They have even established a Planetary Defense Coordination Office, aka PDCO. It ensures that potentially hazardous objects get detected as early as possible. An object is considered potentially hazardous if its orbit is predicted to bring it within 5 million miles of Earth. It should also be large enough to reach the surface of our planet over 100 feet across. Interestingly, a meteorite impact isn't the worst thing you need to worry about. Some scientists warn that the most dangerous thing is the shock wave produced by a meteor breaking apart in the atmosphere. For example, one meteor, which originally was an asteroid the size of a six-story building, entered our planet's atmosphere in February 2013 and broke apart 15 miles above the ground. This generated a shockwave that was equivalent to a ginormous explosion. An even larger space visitor was called the Tunguska meteorite. It was also 10 times more energetic. It broke into pieces over the Tunguska River in June 1908, 
flattening 500,000 acres of forest. If the meteorite hadn't been so huge, this event would have gone undetected because of the remote location where it all happened. So it's a good thing that 90 to 95 percent of meteors don't survive the fall through our planet's atmosphere. Only those that are made of stronger materials make it so far. Most meteorites, though, are thought to come from comets, which are way more fragile than asteroids. We should also consider the speed of a meteor. If one is approaching Earth at a slower speed, it's more likely to survive the collision with the atmosphere of our planet. It means that the meteor won't burn completely, and some of its remains will reach the ground. In some ways, the United States is a whole different world, totally different from every other place. So let's take a look at what's normal there that baffles people from the outside. One of the first things a foreigner notices when entering the country is flags. American flags everywhere. On buildings, like schools and houses. And on clothes, like shorts, t-shirts, you name it. Throughout history, Americans have changed 27 flags. The current American flag was only adopted in 1960 and is so far the longest lasting flag of the country. It wasn't created by the authorities though. In 1958, there was a contest for a design of the new American flag, and the winning flag was made by a 17-year-old high school student from Ohio. The reason why Americans love their flag so much is national pride. But why not so many countries do the same? Well, some countries avoid displaying them for historical reasons. Other countries only raise the flag on special occasions to highlight the importance of the event. Still, some countries display their flag as often as Americans do. In Denmark, people are quite proud of their flag too. They decorate the winter holiday tree and birthday cakes with them. And you can always find stickers with Danish flags, red and white candles, and other goodies with the flag in a grocery store. People in Sweden are also very much into their flag and have flagpoles everywhere. Now, let's go to a restaurant, shall we? Many things there are very specific to the states. Like, for example, tons of ice in every drink. Turns out there is some history to this preference. America has always had a lot of ice as a resource since New England's lakes and rivers have a lot of those during winter. Centuries ago, before refrigerators and other helpful cooling machines, that kind of cold resource was very valuable and the states started exporting ice to other parts of the world and also, of course, consuming it themselves. They started to put ice in their hot drinks in contrast to the British, who were always drinking their beverages hot. The ice in the drinks has become an American thing, and it was also considered a rich person's drink. Yep, the ice would also show a person's status. Of course, with time, when refrigerators appeared, ice became available to everyone, and Americans started to add it to their drinks commonly. The habit remained, but also ice drinks are very refreshing, which is especially important in the hot south of the country. But if you come from abroad and don't want your drink freezing cold, always specify it to the waiter. The next striking thing is the huge portions that are served, and there is a reason for that too. It wasn't always like this, but in the second half of the last century, due to pesticides and fertilizers, farmers started to be able to grow more food than they used to. The government caught on, subsidizing them to grow even more food. So, the amount of available food increased. Over time, companies started to increase the sizes of their portions. Why serve less food and get less money if you can serve a bit more and also charge more? That's good for business, and it's a win-win. Customers get more food for just a little bit more money. So, larger portions stuck. Okay, now we need to take a little toilet break. And, surprisingly, there are a lot of foreigners who find American toilets weird. First, what's up with those huge gaps in bathroom stalls? Let's start with the more obvious part, gaps on the bottom of the doors. Those are quite common, even outside the US, and they serve several purposes. First, you can see if there's a person inside without trying to break into an occupied stall. Second, it provides some ventilation and makes it easier to clean the floor in the bathrooms. 
the gaps on the sides are more questionable. Of course, people on the outside can't see everything going on behind the door, but still, there's not much privacy whatsoever. In most other countries, the gaps are either negligible or non-existent. So what's up with them in America? I did some research. Some sources say that since every inch of material is expensive, wide gaps are made to reduce the costs of bathroom stalls. Other sources say that when people feel exposed like this, they have fewer incentives to do something illegal in public bathrooms. Next observation, American toilets have way more water in their bowls in comparison to, for example, European ones. The reason is that those types of toilets use different flashing systems, and an American one needs more water to flush effectively. In many countries, especially in Asia, most bathrooms have bidets, which are used for after toilet cleaning, and tourists don't understand why Americans wouldn't adopt those too. After all, if you step in mud, you'll go and wash your foot instead of just wiping it off with a tissue. The same logic works here. Also, it reduces toilet paper usage. So it's more sustainable and it's environmentally friendly. Some say there's a strong stigma in America around bidets that is extremely hard to overcome. Others say that toilets in the US don't have enough room to install a bidet. So they don't have those, especially if there are other well-known ways. Before we leave the restaurant, we need to tip the waiter. Tipping in the United States is way more common than in most other countries. You're expected to tip any service person who helped you with something. While some kind of tipping exists in some other countries, the extent of it is smaller. And there are also countries like Japan and Denmark where tipping isn't a thing at all. Those countries have minimum wage laws that dictate decent wages employers must pay their workers. This way, the need to pay money to service stuff isn't pushed onto the customers. By the way, here's one more fact about the prices. Probably the craziest thing in the states tourists have to adapt to are prices in stores. The tax isn't included into the displayed price and is added on top while checking out. So people who are short on money can't pre-calculate the price they will have to pay to make sure that they have enough money. But really, why is it so? The main reason behind such a weird policy is transparency. This way, taxpayers know how much tax they pay and can resist raising the tax rate in case it comes on the national agenda. Also, it allows buyers to compare the cost of products across states fairly, since tax rates may differ. So, if the tax isn't included, you compare the actual bread costs between Alabama and Alaska, for example. In some places in America, it's not very easy to get around unless you travel by car. In some regions, there's often no sidewalk taking you to the closest convenience store or a crosswalk, allowing you to cross the road right in front of the store. The main reason for that is probably the fact that the United States is a big country with vast lands and everything is spread out. Neighborhoods can be scattered around wide suburban territories quite far away from one another. So that's already far from being walking distance. And sidewalks aren't needed because, yes, no one's walking. Studies show that Spanish or Germans walk at least twice as much as Americans. But in those countries, everything is way closer. And last and not least, you guessed it, the imperial system. It's based on the human body. A foot is an average foot size of a person, so you might think it's quite intuitive for anyone. Well, no. Foreigners are incredibly confused with feet, inches, gallons, and Fahrenheit's, and tend to convert it all to the familiar metric system. Well, in this sense, the British are even more confusing. Those guys use both imperial and metric systems. For height, it's mostly feet and inches, but for weight, kilograms. Great Britain used to have the imperial system, but later they were forced to switch to the metric system. So now, they're using a combination whatever helps to be more precise. <laughs>